Okay, all right. So um, let's get started. So if you remember, I, I think at the end of the last lecture, I kind of breezed through a few things. So I just wanted to touch up on those again. So we talked about, uh, we did a whole bunch of uh, extremely simple KCL, KVL, impedance and uh, noise calculation, right? And based on that, we came up with this equation for the phase noise. Hmm? And what does this equation tell you? This equation tells you that uh, the phase noise, okay, is, um, there are three uh, insights here. One is, uh, what is delta F? Or delta omega. So this, let's say you have this as a tone, you know how far you are away from the center frequency, that delta omega. So the farther you go, what is this equation telling you? Very simple equation. Farther you go, there is a 20 dB per decade uh, because it's square and this is 10. So 20 dB per decade, uh, right? You have um, you have that uh, slope. All right. The second thing is omega naught. Omega naught square. Uh, it's right in the um, in the numerator. What does that tell you? If you increase omega naught, so let's say you're designing a two gigahertz VCO versus four gigahertz VCO. What should you expect? The four gigahertz VCO will definitely have worse uh, characteristics, right? Worse phase noise. And the third thing is uh, this particular piece, which is hmm, P signal. So if your P signal increases then your phase noise, it improves, correct? Uh, and how do you change the P-signal? How? What is your signal swing, final signal swing at the output? Agree? Okay, all right. So that was a key insight. And then, um, you know, this is good enough for uh, hand calculations to understand. Uh, but in reality, what you get is these three, uh, you know, this you get this part and this part, okay? So then how do we... Um, we kind of, the Leeson's model uh, modifies this equation and let's understand this equation, okay? So, in this case you have, um, what does this tell you? I mean, there are two, uh, two pieces um, and uh, let me draw the picture so that it will make more sense. So, this is the modified Leeson's equation and in which you see uh, the component which we have seen. This is what we derived. Okay, this part is from the original simplistic equations, and in that he has added these two, um, you know, modifications. And then also there is a f. What is f? Is a fudge factor. Um, just to make sure that the empirical model and uh, empirically what you get, you can match with the equation. Okay, that's all there is. So let's let's understand this equation. Hmm? So what will happen is, uh, let me see if I have the characteristics right here with me. And let's see if, if this follows, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark three points here. One is um, delta omega, this is this point is um, delta omega 1 over f cube, okay. 1 over f cube is uh, it's not the cube, it's just the, that particular frequency we are calling it 1 over f cube, okay? There is no, I mean, delta omega, there is no cube relationship. It's just, uh, uh, we are annotating it. And here is omega naught divided by 2 cube. So these are the two frequencies, all right? And now let's see what happens uh, in this equation. Let's say your delta omega is lot smaller than this and it's smaller than this, okay? If delta omega is even, uh, I mean even small, it's much much smaller than omega naught divided by 2q, okay. So this is this piece of the equation. Delta omega is much much smaller than omega naught divided by delta q, correct. So then this part of the equation will not come into play, agree? Because the, or am I saying it other way around? What am I making a mistake? If delta omega is below this portion, correct, then somebody help me. I think it's just a math. I'm getting something wrong. Hmm? Which part of the equation will come into play? Ah, okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay. 
got it i got my bearings i got a little bit brain fade there okay so um if this number will be very large okay so we can uh, we cannot ignore this okay so this is my bad okay what will happen is we will ignore this plus one part correct and then on top of that i will have uh, this portion okay and this will be also you can ignore because delta omega is very very small so now we have an equation where you have delta omega in this picture and it has a cube relationship do you see that so the slope here in this case would be 1 over f cube correct so this is slope of 3 minus 3 is that clear because delta omega cube will come into play and once once we satisfy once we go beyond this what will happen this whole thing we can ignore Right, and then this will dominate. Is that clear, Monica? Huh? So then we will get relationship of two, and after that, you know, the rest of the characteristics will come. Are you with me on this? Okay. So this is just to uh, this is our empirical finding, and then with this modified equation, we can do this. Okay. All right. So that was the key insight here, and uh, so then um, you know there are I I said that there are two more. Uh, theories. Uh, one is uh, by Hajimari and uh, Thomas Lee. Uh, this is in uh, 1998, impulse sensitivity function. So, what their observation was that the following. Okay. So, you should know, um, and if you if you want to work in this space, then you should uh, kind of read these papers very well, right? So, uh, what they are saying is, um, you know, because everybody is trying to rather than having a theory which somehow works, we want to get insights and everybody is going after the insights when they are trying to explain. So their explanation is that um, if if I have noise and if I have a waveform like this, right, and if I, if, let's assume the noise is an impulse, okay, and I'm, I'm going to inject that impulse here, 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 in different, different places, okay, what do you see? If the impulse is injected here, it doesn't do anything to your phase noise because it's a, it's at the peak, correct? But the impulse is injected here, here, or here. It will have some effect on our phase noise. So by definition, the timing of your noise is very important. Okay, so then uh, they they put this theory, which is a linear uh, time. Um, basically, the original assumption of LTI is not valid anymore. In it's not time invariant. Okay, so uh, basically uh, they are looking at it as linear time variant circuit. Okay, and then they came up with a very uh, analytical method, um, and you can quantify also for any circuit. You plot something called impulse sensitivity function (ISF). Okay, so you take a circuit and you figure out your impulse sensitivity function. There is a make, there is a simple method that you can follow, and using that impulse sensitivity function then you can uh, figure out the phase noise of your circuit. And it's, um, you know, comes uh, very, very close to what you can see. Okay, so that's one theory. That's by Hajimiri and, um, and, and Lee. And, uh, you know, it's one of the, you know, excellent papers to read if you would like to see how theory is explained, right? Other one is also my favorite, which is uh, by J. Ryle and uh, Asad Abidi. Asad Abidi, happens to be from Pakistan, he settled in uh, in US, he's one of the very highly regarded, uh, you know, and uh, circuit designers. Um, and I think he comes from Berkeley, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, so uh, he has uh, put this theory uh, together uh, with Rael, which is uh, a little bit different. So in that case, what he has done, uh, both of them have done, is they said, okay, uh, the phase noise we think, hmm, delta omega, is given by, 2f uh, kt okay divided by p sig and 1 plus uh, omega naught and 2q delta omega square okay and they said that um, you know we will keep this equation the way it is and we will figure out what this f is so what they say is that f equal to 2 plus 8 gamma r i t divided by pi v0 plus gamma 8 over 9 gm times r. Okay, so let's go through each one of them. So this factor of 2 is basically resonator noise. 
Hmm? So you have your tank resistance, which is the original thing we started off with, right? You have a tank, you have a resistance of the tank, that's what this comes from. This piece comes because of the diff pair noise. Okay, and what is this telling us? So this is basically, what is gamma? That is equal to uh, two by three for uh, noise factor for our FET, FET transistor, okay? And um, V0, what is V0? V0 is a swing, and we know how to figure out the swing, right? Uh, what's, let's say if it's, uh, if it's going in the voltage limiting case, then what's the maximum swing you're gonna get? VDD, right? That's what will be your maximum swing. So you can, uh, I mean, that is basically, you can write it as four divided by pi, the square wave uh, to fundamental transformation, uh, times your tail current times R. Okay, and maximum it will be VDD, this I tail uh, times R. Uh, this is, yes, peak to peak, yeah, correct. I tail by R times R will be peak to peak, right? Peak differential amplitude, okay? So that's what this is what it is. Okay, so um, that's V0 and the third part here and then we will start drawing um, our conclusions, right, is the tail current. Hmm? Noise. All right, the gamma is again two-third uh, for, for this case, right. So what is the insight from this F factor equation, right. So what this is saying is what will happen if the tail current increases? What do you think will happen? If IT increases, what will happen to our F? Hmm? So um, F doesn't change much, okay? Because you would probably hold this value constant. Okay, GMR you have to hold constant, right? For the, uh, uh, so um, if, if you do this then, um, and if IT goes up, and as long as you hold uh, GM bias uh, times your R constant, and I'll tell you what this means, right? Uh, then um, F doesn't change. So if F doesn't change, then what about our power signal? Unchanging current. Huh? So V0 will change, right? So a phase noise will improve. as V0 square, which is our power signal. So that is your IT square. It will improve like that, okay? But, however, if you keep increasing uh, uh, IT further, at certain point, what will happen? You will be limited by the swing at the output, okay? So um, the v, v output swing is limited by V supply, okay, and basically uh, then uh, what will happen is our, this part starts getting limited, okay, so then F will start increasing and your noise contribution will start increasing, okay, so then your phase noise will start increasing. So what you would typically see is, okay, um, if this is your phase noise and this is your IT, the tail current, then um, as, uh, as the tail current increases, the phase noise drops, okay? However, after a while, it will start picking up, F will start picking up, okay? And if you look at the oscillation amplitude, you will see some kind of effect. It's getting, this is my, okay? So uh, the insight here is the following, uh, that your tail current, Huh? should be just enough and don't overdo it. Don't increase your tail current too much. It should be just enough to switch both sides basically. Uh, so you, you want to get uh, the tail current value uh, such that um, you drive the amplitude to Vmax and after that don't, don't do it. So you want to kind of land up in this kind of zone, 
somewhere here. Hmm? Because if you're here, then you your phase noise will be worse. And you don't want to be here because, you know, phase noise is getting, uh, you know, uh, phase noise is again uh, getting worse. Okay. So, um, that's the, I just wanted to repeat all these things for you. Um, after this, now I'm going to do something um, uh, very important because you are you're already, you already received the, uh, the project uh, paperwork, right? So, uh, let's start about talking that, talking about that today. Okay. So, I'm going to tell you a VCO design procedure. Okay. So, this is kind of critical because you will kind of follow uh, this procedure. Okay. And um, if you want a reference, it's in Razavi 8.8. .8. Okay, so let's draw the uh, the picture. Uh, I mean, please draw the schematic of your. And um, I don't want all of you to do exactly same VCO schematic. You know, we have learned so many of them. Um, you can choose any one of them. Okay, different, different thing. And you will have a little bit different performance. It's okay. It's not like just because you got the best phase noise, you're going to get more points, type of thing, right? So I want you to explore all possible things um, in your VCO design. Okay, and um, so let's uh, let's go through the process. And this this today's lecture would be extremely helpful for you to do the project. And project has a lot of weightage, so it's important that you do it. Otherwise, your grades will suffer, and I don't want to do that, right? So, okay, so let's draw the. Something like this. And then we have our R of P, L, L, okay. And then here is my cap. Okay. And then, uh, then we have um, this is my varactor. So, you should use the devices we have specifically given to you uh, in your uh, project uh, definition. Okay, so don't, uh, don't use something different from those components because uh, then, you know, you may get into unknown area. Um, so, we have, we have um, you know, we have good experience with these devices uh, that we have given to you. So, just use them. So, there is no surprise for you. And we are also giving you a lot of... Uh, how do you figure out the phase noise, you know, those kind of things. Um, there are lots of documents which are given to you. So use those. Hmm? All right. So this is my varactor. And then you will have some load capacitor. Okay. And this is my weight load. Let's say this is your schematic. So then how would you go about designing this? Uh, this particular VCO and what will be the specs that are given to you? The specs are basically your center frequency, omega naught, hmm? then your output swing, then power consumption, okay, then load cap value. And then basically you want to make sure your VGS and VDS max. What is this for VDS and VGS max voltages? That's for your reliability. Okay. And of course, most important is phase noise. So these specs will be given to you. Okay. So how do you approach this design, right? Because you cannot just start some with some random parameters and, you know, keep going. It will take you a long time. So we will utilize all the insights that we have, we have kind of put together, right? So... First of all, as soon as you're given power, okay, so then your max uh, ISS, we know, once you're given power, right? Um, so it's, it's okay, you know, you can go through a first iteration and you can modify things to the second iteration. So uh, nothing wrong with that. So uh, that's the learning process. Okay, so first, uh, here are some ballpark values that you want to start from. Okay, so first you say um, uh, maximum ISS. And what will this do to you? 
what will this give you ISS? Hmm? Huh? Swing, it will give you the swing. And what is the voltage swing? What is the voltage swing given by? First of all, it is ISS times Rs of P and then 4 divided by pi. So, that will be our swing. So, then this gives me Rp is equal to max swing that we desire divided by 4 divided by pi ISS. Agreed? So, now we figured out what Rp value is for our LCDC. Okay. So, now what we will do is we will go and we, uh, we go into our library. So, the way it works in your case, uh, that was not the case for us when we were doing, we would lay out uh, the Jalebi structure and then we would go through a software to figure out what's the inductance, what's the Q and then we try it out, right, those kind of things. So, it was a pretty laborious process for you, you are very lucky. The Foundry provides uh, a tool where you play with the numbers and you already experienced that, right, when you did the LNA design. So, in this case, you, you choose the smallest inductor value. Why smallest inductor value? Ah, so, Rp at omega naught. Okay, so you want to do maximize the Q. Q, correct? And what happens uh, for, uh, for in case of Rp divided by omega naught L? And that's the reason we want to, uh, what happened? Okay, okay, all right, take your time. Um, um, so, we want to minimize our L value. Okay, so that um, uh, so that we can maximize the Q. So that would be your next uh, uh, thing you will figure out. Okay, the third part will be how do I choose my M1 and M2? Hmm? So you want to choose the smallest L possible in that technology. Okay, because we we want to get uh, basically re reduce the capacitances everywhere and get your maximum GM maximum swing, right? So, so we and so you would start with um, um, smallest uh, L and we would choose W. You choose W. How would you choose W? So that you see complete switching from left to right. Hmm? So you will see, you can try, uh, um, you know, varying the W value and you can start seeing, observing the currents in both sides. And is the current switching completely? If you overdo it, does it help you? It doesn't help you anymore. So just make sure that it's enough uh, for, for complete switching. Huh? No, you have a bias current on the bottom, right? That current has to flow to one side or the other. If you, if you keep your W small, okay, the current will just go a little bit here and there. Correct. It will, it will go on one side and the other side, one side and the other side. You just observe uh, when you, uh, so complete switching uh, with your V-swing. You tell me. If you keep increasing W, what will happen? You will add more capacitance also in the picture. So, this is on the peak of the current source to Peak of the? It will rise, stay constant. It will rise in fall time. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Like that those can be as large as possible. Well, I mean, I am giving you a starting point. The so starting point is you want to, uh, for to get the desired swing, okay, because after a while the swing is not going to change. Because if you are going completely switching like a square wave, the swing is stuck, right. So, we want to get to that swing value, whatever we want, and you can look at the spectrum of your VCU and you can see how much swing you are getting and just enough W by L to, to get you that swing, okay, that's it, okay. Um, I am just telling you where to look for, what to look for. Uh, you know, don't just look at only one thing, which is, oh, the swing looks good, okay, type of thing, right? Then you will not get any insights. You need to go poke inside, you know, uh, how much current is flowing to either side. So, that's all I'm trying to tell you. The next part is going to be, hmm, you have certain range. So, how do you handle the range of your VCO, okay? So, you would uh, kind of, uh, let's say you're asked to do omega naught. That's what you need, right? 
So in this case, what you would do is let's do uh, ninety percent of the omega naught. Okay, is equal to one over square root of L and C. So we have already figured out L. Huh? Now we will figure out what the C is. And the C value, what we want it to be, is equal to L divided by 0.9 omega naught square. Huh. No, this is C total. There is an inductor and rest of it is all capacitor. That capacitor is coming from whole bunch of places. Right? There will be some parasitic capacitances, there will be CGS, there will be C, uh, CDB, uh, there will be CGD, whatever comes in. Right? So all those things, and I am going to write those down for you. Huh. Hmm? Did I make a mistake? Okay, thank you. So... Thank you. So this would be square is equal to 1 over LC. Okay, so then uh, C is equal to 1 over L 0.9. Omega naught square. So excellent. This is wrong. Thank you for catching this. And then L, right? Is this what you want? That's good, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you for catching that. Okay, are you with me so far? Hmm. And what is the value? Huh? Huh? 0 0.9? You're going to get that, yeah. I mean, we could have just said omega naught square, okay? But then I want some variability because this C is going to change quite a lot. Ah, minimum and maximum, all those things, right? So, so that's why we start with a 10% lower. Um, so, so this is going to give me C total hmm, is equal to this value. And what is the C total? CGS plus... If you remember, we did this before, CGD plus CDB plus uh, CP, which is, this is inductor parasitics. Hmm? And then uh, plus your C load, which is the next stage, whatever buffer you have. And then uh, the last thing is uh, also an important thing, which is C var, where actor max. Okay. So when your director is offering you max capacitor, I should be able to get uh, 0.9 uh, omega naught. Okay. Now you can also then uh, from this, uh, once you know, once you go through this equation, you can determine uh, C var min for your reactor. Hmm. And then this will give me the last part, which is omega max hmm, is equal to 1 divided by square root of everything else L0 except the only thing that will change is C var uh, min. Okay. Agreed? So this will give you, basically it will be centered around uh, omega naught. Alright. So go through the process. Um, it, it's not that hard. Um, now, I want to show you a final result so that um, I, may, I can inspire you to do a good layout, okay? Because if you try to do a VCO layout, like a digital layout, right? Just connect wires from here over there, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work, okay? So it has to be a beautiful piece of art. I'm, I'm harping on that word. It has to look like art, okay? And I'm going to show you, um, and I made the mistake in the previous times, I never showed the VCO layout to anyone. As a result of which, everyone took their artistic freedom and they came up with their own Van Gogh art, okay? And then only some of them work, okay? So, so it's better to show you how it should look like so that you, you do the work in that direction, okay? So the, uh, here is a okay, piece of art. Okay, now I'm going to explain you each and every piece. So kind of focus on the thing. Uh, what's the top piece here? Huh? This is our inductor. So you remember how we figured out the value of the inductor. Now in this particular case, this is the factory generated inductor where I put in the values that I want. You can use the factory generated inductor, but then you better make sure, uh, double check using other tools that it's really giving you what you want in terms of what's the, uh, what's the Q value, what's the, you know, what's the uh, resonance frequency of that. 
um, that inductor and everything like that. All right. Okay. And now um, I want you to kind of start. First of all, what is your opinion about this layer? What do you see? Ah, 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 what do you see? Ha. Huh. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. Good, good. You see that, right? So, um, here is something that I want you to learn out of this class. It's how do you appreciate art? Okay. So, as soon as you see this, and if you're not aware of what's going on, you say, hey, what is this? You know, why is this sitting here? And why is this sitting here? This looks ugly, right? First of all, that's what your opinion will be. But then you have to remove the clutter. Huh? They are not important. I mean, imp of course, everything is important in an RF analog piece, but relatively not important. Okay. So you don't do, first you do only this design. Okay. Now what do you see? You are not able to magnify it further, but you get the hang, right? Uh, so only see this piece. What do you see? It's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect symmetry. So the way, uh, uh, and this is from our chip, uh, Drua chip. You, you are all aware of Drua Pro, the next one, right? So if you draw a line uh, right here in the middle, okay? Of course, this has gone through many, many revisions, right? So uh, I'm I'm very harsh critic when it comes to layout. So people had to, whoever doing the layout, they, they had to face a lot of, uh, because I can visually see very quickly something is not right. Huh? And it has to be that that's something that you have to acquire as a as a art critic, right? So if you look at the uh, half circuit, you know literally what you do is you lay out only one side and you flip it around exactly like that, and you make a cell out of the left side so that if you make any changes, it's reflected on the other side. Because what happens is uh, if you if you don't do that and you make some changes here and you repeat some changes here. Human beings cannot replicate things. So there'll be something here and there. Uh, so not good. I mean, maybe it will work, but uh, not good as a philosophy. So always do half the work uh, if you can. Okay, so do half the work and it's it's perfect. I mean, if you look at what, what is this green piece? That's a thick metal. Why thick metal? Huh? No, you don't want any IR drop. Your inductor is going... Uh, I mean, your, your swing is going up and down, right? So you cannot have a small wire going everywhere. It will not work because that uh, the resistance of the wire itself will kill you. Okay. Even though however small it is, because you have such a wonderful inductor, which has a very thick metal. And now you draw a tiny small wire, which people had done in the previous, uh, previous years. That's why I wanted to show you this piece. Okay. So when you are doing RF designs, when you are doing uh, high performance design, Remove the area out of your brain. Okay. Don't, uh, you know, don't worry about the area in the beginning. Okay. We don't want to squander area. Okay. Uh, but in the beginning, remove area out of the, out of the picture. Because what happens is people latch on to area. And they say, oh, why I need you? I will make small, 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 small. Circuit doesn't work. And you spend another redesign, 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 and you have lost a lot of time. So in the beginning, remove area out of the picture. And you do the best possible performance you can get out of your circuit. And that goes about almost anything you do in analog. Okay? And once you are finished with the design, once everything works, then you say, what is this piece? Oh, this is digital. Ha, I'll make it smaller. It doesn't contribute to my performance. right? I don't have to have a large W by L to do an inverter type of thing. So those are the thought processes you have to do. Uh, remember that. And, and you know, you may say, oh, sir, what is this? Bad design, lot of area wasted here, lot of area wasted here, lot of area wasted here. Don't worry. All that stuff is taken care of when you go at the top. We utilize every piece of area, okay, in when you go. But the quality of your circuit has to be super good. This purple piece that you see here, that is a keep out area. There's nothing can go in, inside that because otherwise the model of your inductor will change. That's why it is that. All right. So now let's come back to our uh, more um, kind of how do we analyze this? What, what have I we, have we done here? Okay. So is it clear what we have done? Okay. What do you think is happening in this middle piece? Huh. So everything here. Okay. So now I will teach you how to how to take stuff out. Huh? 
is this really important is this important does this have to be symmetrical no remove out of the equation like you take the current and you usko by side mein bitha do wo baad mein dekh lenge you get my point because why do you care if the current is uh, the final value of the current is what needs to flow is that clear okay so that we take it out now um, the inductor part you are already sure right so this inductor part let me right clear okay so now the rp comes because of the inductor okay so so now we have a varactor capacitor and you have yet another capacitor which is uh, and this is something we change right it's like a gear box right you uh, you know the car is running slow you have a different gear you change the gear so depending upon the where you are operating you are changing the, the cap valve all with me okay so um, rest of the piece is what's inside okay so let's go in there okay so if you, you, you do you remember we did a um, current sharing design a current reuse design earlier so where rather than using just nmos we use nmos and tmos both cross coupled diffeter okay so this is what that is and now suddenly the mystery will be clear to you so this is your nmos and tmos okay they are such a tiny piece and rest of the stuff you can see how big that is right the active device is only this much and what is the purpose of this active device what is it doing the cross coupled pair it's giving you what negative resistance you got it and it has to be just enough to give you that switching piece that we learned okay there is no point in overdoing and all that stuff over okay now let's come back to our capacitors so the varactor piece is right here these are varactors okay maybe i should not use this okay so now we can enlarge it further thank you so much okay all right so now i can enlarge it. okay wonderful wonderful excellent it's good enough right huh? so now um uh coming back these were our devices okay let's not use this color let me use just white uh do you see the white now these are our nmos and tmos pairs and do you see something else so uh, what i want you to notice is how thick these lines are okay as big as big as possible because they are at a very top level metal don't worry about the parasitic capacitance there okay because you need to be able to uh, you the resistance of that line has to be very very small hmm? and then it it comes all the way till here so it's like a inductor and then it comes down like a fork tuning fork and then everything is attached to that fork if you see so um, these are okay so let's keep things simple first of all do you remember i told you you have a bunch of capacitors switching capacitors uh, and to make sure that you get this curves right you know various curves so that you don't have a dead zone okay and that is this piece so you see this capacitor you see second capacitor you see third capacitor you see fourth capacitor fifth capacitor and six capacitor okay do you understand what thermometric means hmm? you add one capacitor you add next capacitor you add next capacitor huh? so it's not binary switching hmm? intentionally because you cannot have a discontinuity when you do this capacitor switching okay uh, because otherwise i mean you can do it you can do the binary switching but you have to be ultra careful so we just in this case we are just adding one capacitor at a time okay and this piece is there is a binary input coming in and then it converts it to thermo okay so uh, we want to change the cap cap bank that is coming in as a binary so in this case 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 so means you have how many bits 3 bits you have uh, you have 3 bits binary and it will give you Zero 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 one zero 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 one one, and that is your thermometer code. So the binary, and you will see that you know since we are so paranoid, we replicated the uh, even the digital piece on both sides because ठीक है. Easier was to connect the binary connections. Okay, all right. So now uh, these are the switches uh, which are required to uh, to add each capacitor. Agree? 
because you have to you have to do this right you have to have a cap and you have to have a switch and um, so so that's what that is and then um, so this is your uh, six units of um, you know discrete tuning all right okay now let's move to the inside piece uh, we talked about this we talked about this we talked about all this we talked about this and then let's move inside so what's happening here so in this case um, this part is a reactor okay sorry the blue part these are the reactor pieces and then um, we have a bunch of capacitors so uh, the way it works is like this I don't remember which way it is done now but you have a reactor and you have a large capacitor if you remember series capacitor correct okay? so that's what is going on here something like this so this is your C bar and this is my center point and um, I am changing this part okay um, this is also a bias okay so I can change the bias uh, to get uh, I think we did it last time right if you remember that uh, large capacitor and all those so, so the parasitics are taken into account when we are doing all this stuff what it gives us is we it allows us to uh, to completely go from one end of the uh, biasing for the reactor you know completely and then you exercise the entire swing so that's what this piece is so this is that large capacitor if you see these are the large capacitors i think we'll stop right here any other questions Polo? Uh, just one second one last thing i wanted to tell you is many designers go through all this pain and then they mess up in one place they think that i mean i think people who are in my lab they are already tired of hearing it they feel that the monies are coming out of their pocket if they lay metals okay as an analog designers you should flood everything with metal, okay till the capacitance is bothering you okay for example vdd lines ground lines you flood them okay so in this case you see that how big the VDD line is okay because those are the problems which are the toughest ones to debug if you have an IR drop problem in your VDD line or a ground line it's the toughest one to debug a parastic capacitance is easy to detect and fix but parastic resistance is a lot harder to debug and to fix okay agree so you would rather be on the other side and cap I can fix I can easily detect and fix I can find out where the capacitance is and that's where I'll fix it uh, would you remember that okay don't draw uh, like you have this such a big inductor okay and then you have a thin line going from here and that's my VDD line it will not work because that will contribute a large resistance it'll have an IR drop the large current that's flowing through it it may blow up okay so always draw your VDD ground lines like big fat runners okay so typically you're designing any circuit an op amp huh? as a good analog designer what should you do I'll tell you the trick right so let's say there is a one unit minimum uh, length right so you say okay I'll start with a 12 units of wire this is my VDD and ground hmm? and then everything else is between in between how you want to do it and make sure you put in lots of contacts okay don't just um, and you know it's not like a digital gate where you just have to put a like a ticker uh, you have to put big fat wires uh, minimum four contacts is the rule I go by okay so uh, we are all paranoid huh? this is what I I'm always thinking right and so suppose I'm having a metal contact and this is another piece of metal okay if you have just one one contact hmm, you're you're making your design very susceptible to process because that contact resistance is going to change all over the place it's a very variable Huh? so what we like to do what I like to do and I always look for is 
um, you know, don't make things fatter first of all. So then it will be one is bigger, the other one is this way and put minimum four contacts, something like this. At least two contacts or minimum four contacts. Now the contact resistance, four of them are in parallel. Okay, so all the stuff improves. This is something you cannot do later. Correct. Once you have packed everything, then you cannot go in and change the metals, you know, all that stuff. So it's a wasted effort. So you have to throw your layout over again, start again. All right. So enough of layout. Let's move on to the next topic. Any questions on the layout? So would you would you create your piece of art? Keep all the things in mind, you know, whatever I told you. I, at least people who are in this class attending right now, I, I expect high quality layouts. Okay. Because if you can do high quality layout, then you'll learn something from this class. Have a look. Yeah. So, yes, yes. So, in the previous years, we had given them switching and everything, right? Uh, but this time, since you have only two weeks, and I'm very sensitive about your end sense schedule and everything, and I don't want the project to go close to the end sense. So what we did, I mean, we had a lot of argument back and forth yesterday with the uh, with the TA team, and I kind of you should thank me for that. I forced them to remove the the variable part. Okay, so you will not have to do variable part because I want you to learn rather than uh, so. Every, every design, right? There is a lot of grunt work and then there is a work that you just understand how this thing. So I want to focus with single capacitor. You can break it down in small, small pieces, but I'm, uh, we are removing this uh, variable cap, discrete tuning part. Okay. That is something we have done earlier many, many times. So I think you can look at my previous lectures for that. Okay. There is a, a layout lecture. Uh, we did it in E618, right? I would recommend you to go through that. I and mean, maybe all of you should go through that 618 layout lecture. If you really want high quality layout, it will give you a good, uh, good feel. Uh, and I cannot repeat the whole thing right now because it will be unfair. Please do that. Uh, that will give you appreciation for how do you choose W, how do you choose L, how do you choose fingers, when to use multipliers and all those things. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this piece right now. Huh. You tell me. No. Yeah. Yeah. We're not worried. So you can. Uh, okay. So one piece I, I, I didn't tell you about is what is this? And what is this? Okay, now I don't remember what this is. I think one of them, this is the bias, uh, bias current that's going in, if I remember correctly. And the other piece, and then there are buffers here. ECO buffers and there is a lot of testing circuits because you want to bring those signals out and you want to see something inside health of your so a lot of testing pieces are done I don't remember this piece it will come to me there is a what is going on here okay uh, I, I'll, I'll figure it out uh, right now I'm not it's not coming to me right now. all right so let's uh, let's move to our new topic okay so we have kind of Finished VCO. Huh. What do you think? One inductor, obviously. Yeah. Otherwise, it will become like really big, right? Even it is shown this way, right? So that's the beauty of it, right? Even if it, we show it this way, the way I have shown it here, but um, it's still one inductor, and you can center tap it. Now, in this particular case, there is no center tap. Why? I already gave you the answer a few minutes ago. Memory, memory. Ah, yeah. What is going on here? This circle. What kind of... There is a PMOS device and a MOS device. 
right? So they were PMOS is on the top, NMOS is on the bottom, then inductor is in between, in between, not going to VDD. Okay. And advantage of NMOS PMOS combination is also the swing is limited to VDD. It will not go VDD and above. But you are more than welcome to try all options. Okay, I'm not saying that you have to do it this way. I mean, simplest way to do it just NMOS or PMOS. And I would prefer that people try different different ideas and then you can compare your results with each other. All right. Bala? No, you are given all the things uh, in your uh, in your document what you should choose. Because inductor you have to find a new value. In terms of the type of the inductor, it's all given to you. Everything is listed out in your uh, what type of inductor. I don't remember if it's exactly the same as before, but probably it is. Okay. All right. So um, with all the stuff that we have done today about the VCO, um, we will start with um, with a new topic, huh? which is kind of an exciting topic. Phase, lock, loop, uh, intro. So at least we'll cover the introduction today. Okay. Uh. Uh, can we Okay, let me do this. Uh, we will hold a session for all of you because there are lots of layout related questions uh, where we will kind of, you know, really hammer through all the issues. Uh, so that you, I want you to do a good layout. I really want to show off your layouts, right? Because that's a, that's a matter of pride for me if my students are able to do good layouts, right? Um, so uh, why don't we hold a session for all of you? Uh, where you kind of, we teach you, you know, okay, if this is a problem, this is what you do. Um, so that will help you quite a lot. Okay. I can answer all the questions, but what will happen is I will get digressed into that. I get excited about uh, all these things. So I'm kind of putting damper on myself right now. Hmm? Okay. Um, okay. So what is the motivation for phase lock loop? By now you should have figured out, right? What is, what is it that we are trying to do with phase lock loop? We are generating reference clock. Okay, and what kind of reference clock are we doing? Hmm? So we are doing high frequency, high frequency clock, LO frequency, which is like in gigahertz and giga, whatever it is, right? So, however, is it just high frequency? It's extremely accurate. Remember, right? You are uh, you are uh, trying to receive a signal at 2.4 gigahertz, and what is the bandwidth? 200 kilohertz and if you miss that part you will be in the neighbor's channel right something like that so so you you want to uh, design this clock uh, or LO uh, local oscillator frequency but accurate we want to do accurate LO okay and it should not be just accurate you should be able to go to the next frequency also so it has to be programmable correct And then uh, over time, what should happen? Should it change? It should absolutely not change. It should be stable rocks on it. So that's what we are doing when we are uh, we are doing we are going after the phase lock loop. That's the main motivation. So I'll quickly draw a you know. So this is a diplexer. I'll explain this just in a minute. And many of these things you have already learned. And this is our receiver. And this is something you should be able to draw in your sleep. Once you... Okay, so here we have ADC. This is a gain amplifier, variable gain amplifier. This is a low pass filter and in one side you will put cos omega LOT, another side will put sin omega LOT. Agreed? So this is our entire chain. This is our LNA. This is your matching network hmm? at the input. Diplexer, what it does is, um, you know, the signal can only flow this way or this way. This way would be uh, 
again a matching network and here we have a PA and we are going to talk about PA as we get to the tail end right and here you will have up converter these were down converters and these were up converters and you remember right up converter what do you do you take the plus part down converter we take the minus part okay? and here also you have the same part which is your um, uh, sine and cosine and I'm just simplifying this as BAC and most of you are doing a uh, mixed signal class right okay so ADC DAC you are already covering okay and then um, the filter part we have already covered in 618 um, and we covered LNA we covered mixers and now we are covering we covered VCO and now we are covering the frequency synthesizer and we will also cover this PA part as we get to the end of the class right so so here um, so let me draw a um, you know it's kind of too crowded right now here maybe I can draw here hmm? so typically you have something called a frequency synthesizer okay synthesizer which will generate all these things for you all right and then what is the what is the incoming thing for you it's going to be a crystal oscillator hmm? so this is a crystal oscillator of course crystal is outside uh, outside the chip okay um, and the reason for the crystal is it's a mechanical property and it's rock solid doesn't matter temperature changes uh, it's extremely accurate so once you buy a crystal for 16 megahertz it will always work at 16 megahertz I mean I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit of course you know if you if you're a purist then it's not but uh, for all practical purposes it's absolutely accurate in parts per million type of accuracy all right so uh, we take the crystal oscillator frequency and we generate these frequencies in gigahertz and these a uh, crystal oscillator is typically like a 26 megahertz or 16 megahertz 13 megahertz whatever you want to choose and typically a phone has one crystal oscillator and then it is just routed everywhere else okay all right so one purpose is to generate these uh, you know um, LO frequencies the other purpose is you know this ADC is going to need a clock okay so you need a synchronous clock going to the ADC okay so that will be running at I don't know 100 megahertz or 50 megahertz whatever so that clock I need to provide okay um, what else uh, we need to provide a clock to our transmitter TXLO so it will come from that all right um, and then um, what else uh, is going on where I need a clock of course DAC also needs a clock so all the stuff once you have a 16 megahertz or a, a 26 megahertz uh, you know oscillator um, the, the, the oscillator part of this crystal is on chip generally you only attach the crystal it will oscillate and it will um, wake up at the right frequency and it will provide a reference frequency so today we are going to talk about this frequency synthesizer part okay phase lock loop frequency synthesizer all right so let's kind of appreciate the problem first so typically we are doing let's say uh, LO for RX or TX okay so we are going from let's say 2 to 6 gigahertz range okay so let's take a GSM example this is 1900 and uh, GSM uh, 1.9 gigahertz uh, the channel spacing is 200 kilohertz okay okay so the required uh, accuracy is 100 hertz I hope you appreciate the units 100 hertz so um, let's say you have all these channels right this is your 200 kilohertz but this thing can only vary 100 hertz so you can imagine right so let's take an example so let's say if it's 100 hertz and this is 1900 close enough to 2000, uh, 2000 hertz uh, sorry 
megahertz correct this is 1900 means 1900 megahertz or 1.9 gigahertz so this is 2000 close enough for calculation what is the uh, parts per million that you can get can you tell me what is the accuracy that we need Phi 10 to the power minus 8. So we like to tell in TPM. So multiply by 10 to the power 6. 0 0.05. Parts per million. Very accurate. I mean, it seems like a daunting task, right? So, because otherwise what will happen is, even if you move left and right, you will get into neighbor's channel. Okay? So you don't want to do that. And there are very stringent requirements. Okay, so we have to basically uh, design uh, such an accurate, uh, uh, you know, uh, LO frequency. So you not only that you want to design these different, different, you should be able to move from anyone to anyone. Okay, there are a whole bunch of them. Okay, so how do you do that? Okay, that's the, uh, that's the topic that we are going to discuss today. And a good reference that I like to use is uh, go to the website called CPP SIM dot com okay and um, michael perro he is uh, he has created a lot of uh, collateral on this topic and i use it quite a lot um, i mean excellent um, reading material and he has a tool a software tool uh, which you can use to design a pl Okay, so as we go forward, you can play with it and uh, it will give you insights also if I, because PLL is a system by itself. So uh, there are lots of moving parts and you need to have appreciation for if I do this, what happens to my final, uh, final result. Okay. Okay. So let's go to a really simple implication, right? So if you, if we can understand the PLL as a feedback system. Okay, so I'm giving you this analogy so that you can, so we have this AS and F feedback factor, V in, what's the sign here for VF? Huh? Plus or minus? Huh? Minus. minus here is minus okay so what is our v out by vs here can somebody tell me uh, v out by v input is equal to a of s divided by 1 plus a of s times f okay so what is the property of the feedback what is the most important property why we use feedback if you remember op amp example if you will what are we trying to do in op-amp? Huh? Control what? Huh? Uh, gain what? You're there. You're almost there. In op-amp case, what is A? Very large, right? But it's not accurate. A is not accurate. Remember that, right? Because it could be 10 to the power 5. It could be 5 times 10 to the power 5. Okay? But the feedback factor is like a ratio when you, you have a resistor ratio, that is very accurate. So if A is very large, then eventually you will get just 1 over F. And you get a very accurate result, okay? So you get accurate loop gain in this uh, in this process, right? So something similar uh, we are trying to do in a phase lock loop. So let's talk about uh, a phase lock loop block diagram. Okay, so in this case, also, we are doing something like this. Um, please pay attention to uh, what I'm going to tell you now, okay? Uh, because um, it's a classic mistake that everyone does and get muddled up in the phase lock loops, okay? So here, when we are um, when we are doing our feedback system, what is what is a variable? It's all voltages, right? So it's very easy to wrap your head around in this as well as soon as you get to the phase lock loop the variable changes okay so just keep that in mind so in this particular case the variable is phi ref hmm, is a phase and this is my uh, phase detector okay 
So this is my plus and let's say this is my minus. And here we have VCO, voltage control oscillator. Okay. So this is a All right. And then this is my V out. Okay. So V out is the, the oscillator, whatever. But what's important of that V out is the frequency and phase is what is important. Okay. Because that's what is going in the feedback fashion. Okay. So what we are trying to do, and, and I think the, for the reference, this was started out in 1932 uh, by a French uh, scientist, B. Bellet. Cs. Okay. So this one, if you look at it, it's a it's a simplest uh, possible thing. You have a reference coming in, and you 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 are pushing this um, some kind of signal over here, and then the VCO will respond to that and give you some output, and that is being fed back. Okay. So if you just look at this particular uh, circuit, right? Uh, you will not get, uh, you know, the the example we were trying to talk about today was 16 megahertz input, and then we are trying to get some gigahertz frequency output. That will that will not happen here, okay? Because here the uh, frequency of the input and output are the same. So where would you use something like this? So let's say you have a uh, you know multiple circuits um, which are running off certain clock. If you want to synchronize the clocks you would try to use a circuit like this because your F in and F out, they're the same. You just want to make sure that they line up together. They happen uh, synchronously. So this is used uh, for clock synchronization, the circuit as is it, as it is. Okay. So uh, let's kind of develop this further. Okay. So what we would do then is we will do the same thing, phase detector, and we would filter it out because we don't want to push this noisy signal into our VCO. And you know, right, how sensitive the VCO is. What is the typical KVCO of the VCO? What did we decide on? Number 200 megahertz per volts. Uh, okay. So if you have 200 megahertz per volt type of uh, VCO, KVCO, and if you have a 1 millivolt noise at the input, Okay, can you tell me what the deviation will be? We have 1 millivolt. 200? Huh? Kilohertz. So you can imagine how bad that is, right? If your input changes by a millivolt, your, the VCO output is changing by 200 kilohertz. And what kind of stuff are we trying to design? 100 hertz. Right, so then, so you have to, you have to worry about that quite a lot. Okay, all right. So we need to filter it out whatever is coming out of the phase detector as much as possible so that we can uh, and now this is my VCO and this is the V-tune and whatever is coming out of our VCO we want to kind of take a divider in the feedback path and I'll explain all, all this stuff to you. So this is my 5F, this is my 5 feedback, okay, in the VCO. Now let's see what's going on here, okay. So let's say my, suppose something like this is coming and then the divided, um, um, first of all, um, uh, we, what you will see is the feedback part, whatever is coming in, will also uh, be of the same frequency and it will be something like this. And the phase detector will give you pulses, which kind of looks like this. Okay. And it will give you some, uh, the filtered output will be some voltage that will go in, retune. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, we are trying, starting very, very simple stuff. And then once we understand this, we will peel the layers further and we will uh, build a complicated circuit, right? So in this particular case, okay, uh, what is our 5B? Hmm? Um, the 5 feedback minus. So when, when this particular loop is locked, huh, uh, what will happen is, um, 
you will have uh, basically the, the two frequencies have to be accurate and then there will be some phase difference between the two because finally whatever uh, VCO output that you are getting okay it will be fixed frequency okay so which means that VTune is fixed okay so if VTune is fixed then I need to put in a fixed pattern at the input correct to get that particular value all right so then what will what we are trying to say is that the phi feedback and phi ref t is equal to constant okay when the loop is locked when the feedback loop is locked um, just like in our op amp case right in this particular case um, you will have basically the error voltage will be fixed it depends on a of s of course uh, but um, the uh, for a uh, for a given uh, circuit right your the feedback part um, and v in there will be small error which will go through uh, our a of s um, i mean let's not have a of s as an integrator but let's say just a, okay so similarly here you will have five feedback minus phi ref is equal to constant so then we do derivative of that d phi f p by d t minus d phi ref that will be zero so we can say that okay if that is the case then i will just make them equal to each other and then that means your the feedback part of your frequency is equal to reference frequency okay so if that is the case so f ref and f um, feedback if they are the same then what is the frequency here n times f f p and that is equal to n times f ref agreed so this is a very simple simplest possible phase lock loop okay and our job is to do what now mess with the n okay so we are just going to figure out ways to control this n okay what is the input frequency we said let's say 13 megahertz and what is my output frequency let's say 2.401 gigahertz can you tell me what n is One eighty four. Okay, and how do you do that? Digital, digital piece. It's literally. I mean, of course, there'll be some. Uh, I'm, I'm overly simplifying it uh, to to make a point. But digitally, I can control that divider portion. All of you know how the divider works, right? So you can you can uh, design a divider, and then we can we can do this. Okay. So that's the extremely simple uh, rendition of a phase lock. So um, other thing you have to remember is. If you have a phase lock, then that implies that you have also a frequency lock. But the reverse is not true. The frequency lock doesn't mean uh, you have a phase lock. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I will uh, go through one particular because now we are going to go through each piece of this phase lock. Uh, so today we will wrap up the phase detector part. Okay, so that we can start on next time. So, phase detector. Hmm? Okay, what are we trying to do? We have, you have a x1 of t and x2 of t. Okay, and this is my phase detector. Okay, and what do we want? We want something, some output, x output. T, which is proportional to the difference in phase and uh, so what we want is the transfer curve function should be looking like this something like this and this is delta phi x1 minus x2 okay phase difference between them not the voltage difference phase difference so we are looking at zero crossings okay and then this would be a x output an average value that we are looking for okay all right so the simplest example of a phase detector is is this okay so look at an xor gate okay? and this is my x1t x2t and let's see what happens here 
So I'm going to draw a waveform. So I have a difference which is about this much. So something like this. So tell me uh, what will you see? Um, let's say we start from here. What will be the output waveform? If it's a XOR? Uh -huh. But where, where will be? Initially if it's 0, 0 then what will you get? 0. You don't get anything. Everybody knows XOR gate. No? Only when the uh, inputs are different, 1, 0 or 0, 1, you will get some high output, which is what we are trying to do. So then it will be basically wherever you have difference. So I should see a pulse here. Should see a pulse here. A pulse here. Agree? Okay. So if the two waveforms are lined up on top of each other, what will you get? 0. Right, because it will be uh, the, I mean, XOR, uh, if two inputs are identical, then it will get zero. But as one is start sliding, what will start happening? It will start increasing, the pulse width will start increasing. Do you see that? Uh, X1 and X2, if X2 is sliding, so as the phase is increasing, the width of your pulse will increase. Okay, and the average value will keep increasing. So, do you see how this works as a phase detector? Okay, so that's what we, uh, uh, but it's important that you need to understand the transfer function in this case. So, what will happen is till 180 degrees, uh, it will, so for example, if, if it's 180 degrees, then it will look like this. You'll get the max value. After that, will what will happen? It will start dropping. Do you see that? If the two are 180 degree out of phase, you'll get the max value. But if the phase difference starts increasing, then it will start folding now. Okay, so then this is a piece I wanted you to understand. So this is what happens. Hmm? So this is 360 degrees, 540 degrees, hmm? something like that. And this is my X out bar. And here also it will go through this. So we can, um, what we are interested in is this piece. this part. Huh? And what is 180 degrees? 2 pi or pi? Pi. Okay. So then, um, and what is the maximum value we are going to get out of this? It's going from 0 to VDD. So what's the maximum value of your VDD? Okay. So we have a um, VDD is my max value and then divide by pi. And this is our gain of your phase detector, which is KVD. Agree? Okay, so this is my gain of the phase detector. Okay, so I can model this as KPD. Hmm? So incoming is phi ref and phi FB. So these are clocks coming in or the phase is coming in and the output is what now? Huh, but what is the output? Is it a, is it a phase anymore? It's a voltage. It's a voltage huh? That's what I am trying to focus on. Okay, so this is a voltage output. And this is what you have to remember when you go through the PLL because you will be changing domains. This voltage is now going to go to V-tune and that's going to produce VCO output which is a frequency which is in a way phi out. Okay, and that we are going to feed it to our divider, which will just divide the frequency and then it's being fed. Okay, all right, I think I have uh, taken enough time right now. So, I will stop right here. I'm slightly behind, but uh, that's okay. Uh, was the phase lock loop, at least the introduction was clear? Was there any difficulty? I can answer the questions for you if you want.